Vice Chancellor, colleagues and students, family and friends, neighbors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my inaugural lecture on building performance analysis. I'm aware this is a very busy time of the year for many of you with a lot of coursework coming in and marking to be done. And for others, it's been quite a long journey to come here. I know some people actually are still on the train that is delayed, so there might be other people coming in later. So thanks for coming here and supporting me through this inaugural lecture. Uh -huh. I will today be talking about that subject of building performance analysis, but actually getting this lecture together took a bit of time. I was appointed professor in 2013, that's five years ago. And my first problem that I was kind of working with is that in the Netherlands, an inaugural lecture, an entree rede, is something different from what happens in the UK. In the Netherlands, it's in a formal dress. It's actually a professor talking to other professors. Whereas in the UK, it's more like reading out something or delivering a classical lecture to a wider audience. So I was struggling with that, and I've decided to come up with something which is in between. So I'll be starting to talk about building performance analysis in general. Um, there's a good reason for that. If I talk to my family, if I talk to my wife, she knows that I do something with buildings, maybe something with energy, and then she kind of is left in the dark about what is going on. My kids seem to think that the main job is working on the computer, and that's not fair because I've got unlimited access and their time is limited on there. So I'll use today to explain to them what it is I'm doing. But at the same time, I'm also going to go a bit deeper and bring in some of the challenging aspects of the field for the colleagues in here. Yeah, that keeps in. So I'll start with talking about building performance analysis and go word by word. So what you see on the screen is building and a dictionary definition of what building is. And you can take that apart in two parts. First of all, building as an object a structure with a roof and walls, but also the activity of constructing, of actually making buildings. And what the images show, and these are from the Netherlands, is that not all walls are vertical, not all angles in buildings are 90 degrees. So we're talking about something complex that is not always what you expect it to be. The construction process also is challenging and unique. You see again an image from the Netherlands, a location, a construction site under sea level with a lot of water that needs to be kept out, which has implications for the construction industry there and the way things are done. So that is just building. Then we move on to performance. And again, if we go into the dictionary, we find two definitions. We find one that really fits with a faculty of arts and humanities, where we're based here, a form of entertainment, but also a more engineering uh, definition that talks about the process of performing a task or function, the capabilities of a machine or process. And I'm looking at both of them and applying them to buildings. If you look at the screen, you see, of course, a part of a machine. That's my old computer. When it broke down, I took a picture. And in the middle, you see kids running and starting on a race. And if you look closely on number 106, you see Rick a couple of years ago running around. And for equity in the presentation, later on, you also see a slide of my wife and my youngest son. <laughs> and then there is analysis. So the detailed examination of something. And I'm already doing that, talking about what building is and what performing is, taking it apart in the constituent elements, finding out what we need to take into account. But there's also a part of the definition of analysis that deals with mathematics, with quantification, with numbers. And that will also feature in the rest of the presentation. Now, this rest of the presentation, I will be actually talking about three things, three main items that form the bulk of this inaugural lecture. I'll be talking about the drivers for building performance analysis. Why is this relevant? Why do I think we need to work on that? I'll do a bit of lecturing on the approaches we have to actually quantify building performance. And then I'll end up with talking about the challenges and efforts in teaching and research, what we do, what my chair here in Plymouth tries to achieve, and what do we see uh, for there for the future. If you look closely, and I think it was already spotted down here, we have on the left-hand side, first of all, we have a number. So if you get bored, you can go down to 45. Yeah, there's 45 slides, so you see how far we progress. There's also this little channel. There's a cartoon figure in here, and that is number one. And there's more of them in the slides to come. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be asking how many there are. So please 
keep track of those. So why do we build our with building performance? Why is this an important subject? Well, first of all, we are in a building. We go home, again we are in a building. If we're ill, we go into a building where we're being treated. Buildings are everywhere and they're really key for human activities. They provide a shelter, safety, and they're really important for the quantity of life. The process of construction is also important. If you look at statistics, typically people talk around 6% of a national economy, gross domestic product being related to construction as an area. There's also a negative side to things. If we talk about environmental issues, then one building typically does not have so much of a problem. But if we look at how many buildings there are in the world, then the scaling factor is enormous. And actually, what we do in the built environment really becomes important. So if we teach on the undergraduate level, what you typically do is you start about economic challenges. We talk about what functions buildings perform, what we want them to provide. And then we bring in the environmental concerns and we try to address those. And by doing that, we end up with buildings like this, an eco-house. And there's a definition of eco-house on the, on the screen. Environmentally friendly, low impact, using the right materials, technology. And you end up with an image that looks great, that we can sell to clients, something that we can proud of, be proud of as an industry. If I go to the other side of the world, Australia, again, we have an image here of, in this case, a net zero carbon building. So we use a different term in there and there's a whole bag of different terms we could use here. But again, a nice building reflects the fact that we're on the red continent. And it's something, again, we can sell that we can put in a, in a magazine that we can be proud of as an industry. So far, so good. But there's also a negative side, and I'll show you some slides that are connected to the negative side of building performance. And the first one you might have expected <coughs> was the Grenfell Tower last year, a fire that cost people their lives. And if you look into more detail what happened here is this building was constructed in the 1960s. A couple of years ago it was actually renovated, and a new facade was added to this building to make it more energy efficient. And that was part of what burned and part of what caused this nasty fire and the consequences of that. Back to my native the Netherlands. This is a new parking garage that was constructed at the airport of Eindhoven. And the way this was done was there's prefab construction, uh, floors in there with a topping layer in there, and those two did not bind well together. Then there was a hot summer day, things expanded, and actually the garage came down before it was even in use. It was a good thing, so there was no lives lost, no cars lost. But of course, something that we want to prevent if we talk about building performance. And here another one. Uh, my wife's from Germany, so I follow the news there. This is the new airport over there in Berlin that was decided that this would be constructed when German reunification took place. It was supposed to open in 2011. Construction started in 2006. And they're still working on it. And last week we actually saw in the news that they were talking about adding an additional terminal because by the time this is completed, it will already be so much too cramped that it's not sufficient for the demand they expect in that time. Yeah, so that has to do with the process of construction and again an area where we need to work on. Now from an academic point of view, if we talk about building performance, very often, and we had that in the symposium today, we talk about energy, we talk about carbon, we talk a bit about carbon emissions, maybe thermal comfort and lighting, but there's a whole range of aspects that we need to take into account. And if you look at all these issues, as also well as the examples I gave, then we need to make sure that we address all of them at the same time. I've been dabbling around in this and it's, you can make a list of around 80 aspects that we need to consider and then look at sub aspects of those. So it's a big challenge to handle all of those aspects and get the building right for all of these points of view. If we then think about academically what performance is and how we handle that, there's a couple of things that we need to look at. First of all, we ask about functional requirements. If we have a building, we need to start thinking what is it that the building needs to do. Then performance kicks in, in explaining to us and answering the question how well that must be done. That's a different thing. 
And then finally, numbers and mass comes in, and we try to measure things, quantify things, express them in numbers so we can compare, rank, and handle. Yeah, and if you look at the examples on the screen, there is a point when this poor little building is blown over by the wind, and you want to know at once what wind speed that is, what force that is. If we look about that lovely window and the view out of the lake, then you might want to consider how much daylight you get and how much of the outside you can see. And the example on the far right for you is a building that is environmentally friendly and you can ask how much energy is embodied in there. All those things have to do with the function, with the performance requirement and how we can capture that in numbers. Going a bit deeper, and here's my wife in the family tent during the summer holiday last uh, summer in the USA. One of the simplest buildings we can think of is the family tent. Yeah? And you can look at what the function is, what the performance is, and how you capture that. If you think about that tent, well, the first obvious thing, especially being in the UK, is protection from rain and wind and cold. But if you're in California, you might also want to keep the rattlesnake out, so prevention from intrusion of vermin is something you need to look at. And if you take this on the plane, you want to be able to bring it into a small volume, it has to be portable. And then when you go from national park to national park, you need to be able to set it up in a relatively quick time. We had a period of warm water where you also want ventilation and some cooling in that tent. If we then talk about performance as an aspect where we want to know how well that building is doing its functions, then we need to do an experiment. So for instance, you might give the tent to somebody and ask them, can you set this up? And you would measure on the stopwatch how long it takes. Obviously, there's a whole range of things that have an impact on that. So if I do that on my lawn in the UK and the ground is soft and it has a different aspect than when I do that on a hard dirt area in the US. And the first time I did this with the family, it took quite a long time. After four weeks of camping in the US, we were much better trained and actually the experiment went a lot faster. So there's not just the building, but there's also what you do with the building that has an impact on how you measure and what you find from that. Now, if you look to the real buildings like the one we're in, then life is even more complex. Yeah? So now we go beyond the simple tent, and we find that buildings are made from a whole range of technologies. So we have timber frame, we have metal, we have concrete, often combinations of them. And that means there's no one dominant technology. If you look at the car industry or the aerospace industry, typically there's a one dominant technology. In construction, we have different. Then buildings are around for a long time. So 50 to 100 years is not something uncommon. Buildings are around for a long time. And we intervene in them. I've never heard of somebody who'd taken their car to the garage to take out the gas engine and replace that with a diesel engine. But for houses, it's not uncommon to take out the boiler and replace it with a heat pump or do something similar. Same thing with extensions. Extensions to the house or a loft conversion is a thing that many people do. Bringing your car to the garage to have an extra axle fitted on the back end? I don't think so. Yeah, so that makes our, our industry unique. Then we also deal with a whole range of people. So there's the client, the person that decides to build, the design team, which is actually a whole group of people, including an architect and an engineer, and the contractor, the people that actually start inhabit the building, and all of this adds very peculiar complexity to buildings that make our, uni our industry unique. So that's one thing, but then I'm also going to look at some of the stuff that irritates me, and this is one that I see a lot in this time of the year. I just got a whole pile of dissertations that I'm marking, and I also get a lot of academic journal articles that I review, and a lot of them have these days the same introduction. And that's another type of thing where I think we don't look enough at the complexity that's around. And the typical introduction goes like this. We talk about climate change, that is the biggest problem, and we need to do something about it. And there's a nice citation in there from all the reports from the International Planet, uh, Panel for Climate Change. We talk about buildings being responsible about 40% of global energy use and one third of the greenhouse gas emissions being related to that. And then wherever that paper or dissertation is written, we say our government has pledged to do something about that and we'll bring that down and we put in a time horizon. 
and then we go into the nitty gritty and we say, okay, well, we're actually developing a new piece of software or we have a new gadget, a new system. We start using building information models, work with the smart grid, etc. And that's also the solution here. I need to profess about and against this. First of all, I think that we have a couple of tunnel visions in here, and climate change is one. So I'm not saying climate change is not a problem. Climate change definitely is an issue, and we need to look at it. But there's others one. Yeah? So we deal with housing an ever-increasing population, feeding those people, creating people places where they can work. So just saying climate change is the one and only problem, I think that is too narrow. The same thing for energy. Yeah? So if we build then yes, that building will have an energy use, but there's embodied energy in there. We have materials. We construct in a situation where that building might be replacing a piece of nature and doing damage to a local ecosystem. So just looking at energy alone is not enough. The same goes for carbon. Carbon emissions are linked to climate change, but there's other greenhouse gases. There's methane and other things, and we can actually convert the one into the other and talk about carbon equivalents. But again, I think we should be looking at the wider picture and realize the complexity here. Then I think that introduction had suffered from the magic bullet delusion. And that is what I call, if you have one little contribution to make and you think it will solve this whole climate change problem, I don't think that is the case. And I don't think we reflect enough on your little contribution, how that actually fits in the wider picture and what it really does. And in the building science world, where I'm active, we talk about greenwash. And greenwash is when design teams create a building and then stick a little bit of a photoic element on there, or maybe a small rainwater collection tank. And because of that, they call it a green building, and they pretend that that building is going to be good for the environment. We call that greenwash. But I think that the introduction I've shown is like scientific greenwash. We start from climate change, and we do actually the same, and we should guard against that. One moment of madness, I've written a little paper about that, which you can find on the internet. So I invite you all to go there and prevent this from happening. I'm still talking about why I'm interested in building performance analysis. There's one area that I've neglected so far, and there's more in the architectural debate. So when I started, I talked about the engineering side, but also the art and humanity side. And in that area, there's actually debate on performance and how that might impact architectural form finding and how you do things. And the key word you find there in the literature is performativity. I'm not going to go too deep in that area, but I'm just going to point out that it relates deeply to design theory and that there's actually three roads in there that people look at. The first is normative theory, and normative is really trying to say to people this is how you should do a building, Prescribe, define, give a standard how things ought to be done. However, there's a second group of people that say, well, we're not so sure about that. This prescriptive stuff, we need some flexibility in here. Maybe this is over the top, so let's not do that. Let's instead study what people in real design teams are doing and then reflect on that and try to explain why they arrived at what they did. Yeah, that's a second, second road of looking into the architectural side. And then there's a third group of people that completely refused all of this and you say you need to leave this to the experts, to the people that are educated in there and that just have flexibility as the main thing they champion. So that's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Now what I like to do is I'm more on the engineering side and I like to look at quantifying building performance, expressing it in numbers. And in my view, there are four ways that we can do this. We can use physical measurement, go into a real building, capture things, put in sensors. We can do the other thing and we can actually take a building and put it into the computer and then use the computer to do advanced calculations. We call that computer simulation. Then we can ask experts what they think will happen to a building and we can ask the people that actually occupy buildings, use buildings and ask them what they think about the performance of that building. And I'll go into each of these four categories. But before I do that, inherent in all this type of quantification is that we try to do a good experiment. And the good experiment, you can see that with the school kids on the image, 
actually consists of three things which you need to bear in mind. So these kids are doing some kind of electrical experiment and they have some batteries in there and some wires and that involves the hardware. Yeah? So if we talk about looking at buildings, you can talk about the concrete and the beams that go in there and the glass. That's one side. Then those kids connect poles of the battery and maybe some little light goes burning or some engine starts turning or they get a nice shortcut. They do something and that means exciting the system. And based on that, they observe and they look what's happening and they record that on the piece of, of paper that they have there. In science, typically what we would like to do is to have a preconceived hypothesis that we can test and then we do the experiment and we either say the hypothesis is true or we reject it. But if we're at a slightly less mature type of science, then we might say, well, let's just collect data and data in the form of a time series of input-output pairs, some excitation, something you do to the building, and then look at the other side how that building responds. Yeah, so that's what we try to do with all the four types of quantification. Now let's start with physical measurement and this is actually what you see on the screen. We have the thermal camera on display outside this room. This is an image captured by my former PhD student Matthew Fox of the Roland Levinsky building you're in. Yeah, so we're somewhere here in the building I think. This is an experiment that captures in this case the radiation that comes from a building and we can translate that to temperatures and then try to come to conclusions about how that building is actually doing, how it is behaving. But one thing to keep in mind here is that we cannot completely control the experiment. Yeah? So in this building, you don't know what the outside condition is and we can't control the weather. And what the occupants do in the building is also something partly controlled, but also partly beyond this. Yeah? There's empty seats here, right? We would have liked to have filled this room with more people, but that is you can only steer in a certain direction. What we can do, of course, is take part of the building and put it into a lab. So in the lab, again, we have full control. But if we do something in the lab, then we have to take our measurement, draw our conclusions, but then extrapolate to how that would work in the outside conditions. And that is always a complex thing to do. Then we have computer simulation. Yeah, so now we take, again, the building but we put it into the computer. We see again the Ronald Levinsky building now taken into Design Builder and Energy Plus by some visiting students we had at one point. That's great, but it requires a couple of things that we need to do. We need to model the reality. Yeah? So the geometry is not the full geometry of the real building. You br don't bring all the chairs in this auditorium into your model, you simplify. And then you rely on equations and mass and computer programming. And again, you need to be on top of your game and make sure you use the right ones. If you do that all well, then the advantage of this approach is that we can look at buildings that do not yet exist. Yeah, so a design stage building, can't measure that, but you can put it in the computer. And the other thing is we can run exactly a controlled experiment. We can define what we want to happen exactly set our parameters and do that again and again. Make a slight tweak to the building and redo that experiment. That's one thing that's hard to do in real life. Then there is a third category and this is, I think, when I was looking in the literature, very under, uh, underrepresented in the papers on building performance and that's expert judgment. That's based on experience and expertise of people and it's very common in law where we talk about expert witness. And if you look back at the slides I gave into the introduction, the Grenfell Tower, the collapsing parking garage, the overrunning of the airport, construction time, typically what you would do to get an, a judgment on that and maybe give somebody the blame for what is going wrong, you would go to court and you would bring in expert judgment that helps you give the opinion of whether things were completely unexpected and outside of anybody able being to predict what's happening or whether it's actually somebody who's guilty of neglect and whether there might be uh, a reason to look at those things. If we want to do this, what is very important is that we have 
independent experts, so no vested interests in the case, somebody coming from the outside, as well as a very transparent process. So here, there's definitely no room for biased questions need be to sort through in a good degree. Law, of course, is the, ca the main case where this appears, but you can also bring this into the other area. So one area I've seen is where you can use this approach to find, for instance, heating transfer coefficients. And you can ask experts to give their opinion of what you would have in a certain situation. So you could also mix those things. Then there's the final one, stakeholder evaluation. And this is where the customer is king. We build for people and could say, well, if we build for people, we should ask the people how the performance of the building is. Problem there is that that opinion, of course, is subjective by nature. So if I ask my students how they feel in the Roland Levinsky building, in September when they join the school and they're all geared up to do lovely, interesting things here, you get a completely different response than when the exams are due next week and they're all stressed. So you need to kind of take that out of the equation. But then you could do like s things like surveys, audits, focus groups, walk through, and ask people what they make of the building. There's one term that the experts will recognize, POE, post occupancy evaluation. I've got a bit of an issue with that term, that's why it's in brackets. And that is because in itself the term actually points to a point in the construction process. It is the handover from when somebody starts using the building, and this is post occupancy, so after the occupants moved in. But it doesn't tell you exactly what you're doing. So it's kind of taken as an equivalent for survey, but it could also be monitoring, could be simulation, could be any of those things. So that's a problem I have there. Also stakeholder, I think is a wider term than occupant or user. There's some stakeholders that might never be in the building, but still have an opinion on how it performs. Think of the bank that has made an investment. So I told you we'd have the other son in here. He's Tom a couple of years ago in the house we used to rent. So what I want to talk here about is we have four approaches to quantify performance. And that's great, but there's also limits to our knowledge that we need to recognize. And this is from a psychology, a project we were running with psychology a couple of years ago about occupant behavior and what we could do to save energy. And the first thing that always comes up in that discussion, well, okay, close the doors and the window, prevent the pound sterling from flying out of the door. And can we quantify it? Yes, I can take a piece of paper and make you a little calculation. I can put it into the computer and do a simulation. But when I do that, I realize that there's a whole range of things in the background that make life complex. Yeah? Whether I lose energy has to do whether the indoor temperature is indeed higher than the outdoor temperature. On a summer day, I might actually gain energy by opening the door. Wind direction has to deal with the wind speed has to do with vapor pressures in there, has to do with the turbulence on the outside and what, what impact that has. And what direction the wind moves through this door is impacted whether there might be a window open on the other side, yes or no. Yeah, so it's a complex story. Like I said, I can calculate it on a piece of paper, make some assumptions. If you really want to go to town, you can do computational fluid dynamics and get a, a velocity profile in there. Good. Can we measure this? Well, if you talk about energy, probably it's going to be challenging. This house, we had actually rigged up and I did some energy metering in here. But whether the door is open or not is kind of lost in the noise of all the other things, whether the oven is on and the lights are on and how much time I spent on the computer and all those things. So the time to probably see this is if you measure temperatures, but that's not energy. Yeah, so. And on the animal metering, it's probably just going to be a blip that you don't recognize. So some caution here. We have four approaches, and I can call them silos. There are things we can do and we cannot do, but there's also a problem if we compare those approaches. And what we see often is that there's prediction is one thing, and then you start measuring, you find something else. And one thing where that is very obvious is when we look at energy and people are doing a lot of papers and even hosting conferences. I did one event here at Plymouth a couple of years ago on the energy performance gap. We try to address it and get those technologies, those prediction managers on the same level, but that's difficult and challenging. If we then look at other aspects, so let's say lighting, 
for humidity. There's definitely a performance gap there as well if you do a humidity prediction, but I've never seen a paper on the humidity performance gap. Yeah, so we need to look at those areas as well. Then something I do a lot with the students, we talk about building information modeling. That's a great technology where in the past you would draw a building with pen and paper, and these days we do it in a computer, and we call it the building information model. That's great. We can capture data. But in the context of building performance, I caution against this. Because there's something in there, it's great to capture the data, the geometry, the materials, but building information systems are not designed to capture an experiment. Yeah? So think about the excitation and the observation. BIM is not designed to do that. The abstraction also might be an issue. So if I have a building with a lot of rooms, like the Roland Levinsky building, do I really want to do a simulation with 105 rooms, or do I want to just simplify that in seven zones? Most of the engineers will tell you, simplify it, use some zones. And that's again something that the technology is not designed to do. And then when you start actually collecting performance data, whether the light is on, how much energy is used, and you do that on a, I don't know, half hourly basis, very quickly you collect the sea of data. And again, this technology is not designed to do that. So I caution against this approach, seeing it as the magic bullet for doing building performance analysis. Then I move towards the third part of the presentation and the challenges I see. And one of the first things is terminology. I've given you some definitions, but if I lead the literature, there's quite a range of different views on that. And I think we need to start talking the same language to move forward in this domain. We can also look at other fields, and especially systems engineering and process management have some good things that we might want to apply in construction. But at the same time, given the complexity, which I spent quite a bit of time on explaining to you, there's only one group of people that can see which of the concepts from those other domains would fit into our field. And that's the experts in that area that need to test those assumptions and those principles and see whether they fit in our area. So we need to take ownership of that. And then, like I said, performance gap, there's more than just the energy performance gap. There's a whole range of gaps, and we need to start addressing all of them. Then if you want to design, well, we have tools. We have the BIM to do the geometry. We can link that to tools like IES and Design Builder and do analysis. That's great. But I think we can think harder and longer about tools that really help us achieve the performance that we want. This data collection of buildings, well, you know it from the smartphone and the amount of data that you can get is growing by the day. We had some presentations on that earlier during the symposium. But big data and how we actually analyze that and make sense of all the information we collect. That is something that we need to look at. There's also some fundamental decisions to be made, so smart technology and how we operate buildings. We could make a building like a self-driving car. Yeah? Building is there, you just walk in, you do whatever you need to do, no control, building does it all by itself. Or we could say, no, let's keep the building very simple and make sure that the user knows how to operate it when to open the window, how to turn the thermostat, and use smart users. And the answer to that, we haven't given yet. We need to think about it and decide in what direction we want to take that and what we want to move. And then the aesthetic view, so the arts and humanities view of performance, I think is still underdeveloped. We need to work on that and not let it fall by the side. So if I then look at the application areas, well, we can talk about design. Yeah, we're in a faculty of arts in humanity, so we like to design things. But actually the challenge of designing a well-performing building or a high-performance building is challenging. We need to think about how we do that, how we work in early design, conceptual design, how we deal with the many partners in the process, how we integrate between those disciplines. We need to talk about design decisions and how we make the right ones during the process. And then we need to communicate to the client and the city and all the other stakeholders what we're doing. Then we move to construction. And the image already shows on the screen. A cement mixer on the site. That is actually a challenging thing. So we can have all these lovely visions of how a building might look like and what you want it to do on paper. But at some point, 
You need to get some people together on the construction site, make that building rise from the earth under open weather conditions, often raining. And if you look at construction management, it's really a challenge to make sure the building is delivered on time, on cost, without incidents, health and safety is in there. And one of the things that at the moment already is a challenge is just looking at construction defects. I have a PhD student that's just looking at that aspect, preventing defects. Yeah, but preventing defects does not guarantee performance. That just means that what we have is the product as we specified it. And the performance is something that comes next. One area where you see a lot of work is commissioning. That's the handover from the construction team to the client. And that's one of the fields where a lot of this work is going on. Then there's operation. So the building is out, we run it, but how do we do it? And it's like steering your race car through the F1 formula race. Yeah? Things you have to consider here is a lot of automation going on. And uh, there's an area where a lot of things are going on. So there's a couple of abbreviations there. AMR, automated meter reading, MNT, monitoring and targeting. MMV measurement and verification, FDD fault detection, all has to do with how we control the building, how we run the building, often with computers in there. And this also, if we take this to the next level, at the moment buildings often break down. Somebody has a complaint, somebody else comes in to fix it. That is a reactive approach. If we start measuring performance, we can look ahead. We can say, okay, well, this part of the building is starting to slow down. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And let's prevent it and do a preventive maintenance in there. So we can move to that next level. Then I like to also talk about high performance buildings. Yeah, that's the buildings that are the best that we can do. In a way, that's nice. But I also think, if I look at the literature, that is often seen as aspirational, but not really defined. Building performance is not very well defined. High performance building also is just the direction that we're marching in. Complexity here is that if you want to be on the front line, often you use emerging technology, new ideas that come in. And those new technologies might have teasing problems. And then actually what is supposed to be your front line building, the best we can do, suffer from these teasing problems and does not as well as we wanted it to do. And there's the link with smart and intelligent there. So two images I always like to show if I talk about high performance building is this research station built by the Belgians in Antarctica really challenges your view. So we had an eco house and we had a zero carbon house in the introduction. Or well, think about this beast lives at a temperature between minus 5 and minus 50. That's something different from what we have here on our daily climate. Some wind gusts that blow rocks at this at a speed of 250 kilometers an hour. So it has metal plating on the outside and some special glazing because that is quite extreme. And if this building breaks down, the neighbors are 400 kilometers away. That's a Russian research base. And you don't go, Guys, my boiler has broken down. Can you send the services engineer to help me restore my building here? And if you need something because your boiler has a stuck valve or something, you fly it in. That's quite an extreme situation, yeah? but it challenges your concept of high performance building. I want to be proud of close by, Stonehenge. I like to ask my students, can you design something that's arranged with the solar position? where at the beginning of the new year actually the sun is aligned with the opening. Can you do that? I doubt that. I uh, myself would have some challenge there. Make something that lasts for four, five thousand years as architects, as engineers. Quite a challenge. Something that's going to attract 1.2 million visitors per annum. I wouldn't want to be in that brief that asked to do that. Yeah, and just thinking about the technology that those people have to get the blue stones from two to four tons all the way from Wales to Stonehenge. Really an old monument, but really a high performance building to be thinking about. So as a professor in building performance analysis, I feel I need to have something to profess and work on. So my call to action, the actions that I want to implement to get to better buildings. First of all, stop that greenwash. Yeah? So I think we should talk about what we can do 
and be explicit about that and quantify that. But we also need to acknowledge the complexity of the construction area of buildings and make sure that we claim our own ground. Let's not be run over by the aerospace engineers or the automotive engineers. I also want to make a point of using performance really as something where we quantify how well a building performs. Yeah, and that is carry out a function. And let's make a difference between functional requirements and performance requirements. And let's work on expressing things in numbers. And beware of the tunnel visions. So how are we doing that? And I've been in post for five years, so I've done some work along these lines. Four things, emergent theory, that is the content that we can work on, education, research, and networking. And all of this goes on in Plymouth, and then hopefully is making an impact on a better world. Well, first of all, I've been writing a little book on this. And I'm just starting to do the PR campaign, so this is part of that. 11 chapters, 600 pages, over 1600 references, so I've been doing quite a bit of reading to do that, endorsed by one of the key organizations in my field. Four years of writing, and I think around 10, 15 years of my life invested in this. Available via the usual retailers in the ebook version at the moment, and the paperback will be end of June. I won't bore you into detail in what's in this book, but one thing I would like to point on the screen. If we talk about theory of building performance and what we can profess, then I think that this field only has an emergent theory, we're just starting, and part of my contribution is taking a lot of publications and condensing them into a book. What I can do in the final chapters is actually say, okay, from that reading, from all that digesting of what is out there and what people are doing, I come up with some facts and observations. And it is Newton seeing the apple fall, but now applied to building performance. And I've got around 76 of them in the book. Then from there I can say, okay, some things I can explain. I come up with a comment with some suggestions of why things are the way they are. <coughs> and I can position some hypotheses that people can take forward. I don't think we have laws of building performance yet. That is for the long-term future maybe. But at the moment this is where we are. And the book, if it makes one thing, it makes the contribution of offering those principles and hypotheses to the younger generation, to the wider world where people can actually have a step at that and see, tell me whether that's right or wrong. Yeah? I'm not going to be telling them in detail, but some of the teasers in here so you have a feel of where that goes. Yeah, so one thing has to deal with how you, whether you can actually prescribe a design process and I think we should be very careful in how far we step there. I don't think you should completely freeze and define the process once and for all. I already had to go at BIM and some of the issues that are in there and looking at different performance gap, but also keeping in mind we can try to get those prediction methods to give the same results, but you can't predict a one-to-one -one mapping and you will never get there 100%. Yeah? So you need to also be realistic there. Teaching and learning, we've been active in that field. Um, two years ago, we started a new course in architectural engineering on the BSc level, as well as an MSc in high performance buildings. And I'd like to get a lot of you to sign up and join me on that course. Um, we also have selected research on MPhil PhD level, where people explore a subject and try to make a contribution on that level. We do that in the built environment group but we also collaborate with the architecture department and civil and mechanical engineering. And what you see is more and more pathways that cross over between those different domains. Then there's research and the road ahead, and the kids will recognize where this picture was taken. But the key things I want to do is actually start moving away from just looking at the energy performance gap, but start looking at performance gaps. There's a whole range of them. If you then want to make buildings that will last for a long time, we need to talk about robustness and resilience and buildings that can actually adapt to a change in the climate, a different use, where maybe the space is flexible, and we need to start thinking about how we design those things. Really work about a wider view of performance, energy plus, and that's the name of a tool, but also from now on, for me, something I want to really stand for that we look at the wider range of aspects and with that we need to look at what methods we have to assess performance. So I talked about different approaches 
And for energy and lighting, we're we have four options we can do. But there's areas where we lack the tools. Think about burglary resistance, the way you test things at the moment to bring a door or a window into a lab. You first say the, tell the technician, can you force in your way with bare hands? If that doesn't work, you give him a screwdriver. That's the next level. If that doesn't work, you give him a power tool. If that doesn't work, you give him a crowbar. And then you give him the full destructive whatever you can find. And that gives levels of performance. But can we simulate that? I've never seen any simulation of burglary resistance. So let's start working on that type of tools. So slide 45, and we know what that means. Tom, how many? Nine. Nine. 14. 19. 19. Close. Rick? I didn't hit. How many are there? You didn't count. OK. You're close, but we need to do the lecture oh. again tonight when we get home, because you missed one. <laughs> So what I did here is I put on a slide from a fellow Dutch architect, Lars Spuitbroek, and this is actually the H2O water pavilion on Neeltje Jans, the Delta Works, and it showed the inside of what is, I think, a very spectacular building, not the way you expect it. I hope this lecture has given you some insights in building performance, what it is, what makes it complex, and what fills my day. Um, I'd like, of course, to point out that Becoming a professor and working in this area depends on a lot of people, so I'd like to thank uh, some of them. And you always risk missing one or two, but I'll go over the generic categories in the hope not to miss out too many. Um, first of all, colleagues and former colleagues at TU Delft, ACN, TNO, Georgia Tech, and here at Plymouth. Um, thank you for your help in there. The students and researchers, whether it was BSc level, MSc level, uh, PhD or postdoc. Um, a special word of thanks to three mentors, and there have been more, but I singled out three, which is Rien van der Voorde at TU Delft, Fried Augenbrew at Georgia Tech, and Jakub Rafik here at, uh, at uh, Civil Engineering in Plymouth. I'd like to thank the IBIPSA, International Building Performance Simulation Association, all the people involved that had always been a, a good platform for me to do my research and test my ideas. Similarly, EGIs, the European Group for uh, Intelligent Computing and Engineering, and SIPTI, the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers. I'd then like to thank uh, my parents, friends and family, and especially Anke and the kids who've seen too little of me. I'm always working in my little office, so they need special thanks for keeping up with that. And to end, the inaugural. I'd like to go back to Dutch tradition. Um, in the Netherlands, a new professor typically gives this entree rede, the inaugural, and they always end with the same words, which is a translation of the Roman scholar Cicero and his famous words Dixit. New professors translate that into Dutch, and so I'd like to conclude this inaugural with the same words and say, Ik heb gezegd. Thank you. <laughs>